Hello and welcome back. The main topic of this video is layered network architecture. In this video, you will learn some more terminology which will be helpful in the following discussion. I will introduce layered network architecture and also OSI and TCP IP reference models. End to end argument refers to a set of guidelines that let you uh, let you decide which layer to assign a given function by the end of this video you will know some new terminologies and then you will know what is a protocol what is layering and what is a network architecture you will also know what are OSI and TCP IP reference models and you will have a good idea of what is end-to-end -end argument. There are different ways to classify networks. One way is to classify networks according to their geographical size. This is a list of four such categorizations. The smallest one in this list is PAN, stands for Personal Area Network. The coverage of a PAN is limited to a few rooms, um, that means up to a few meters. Examples of PAN are RFID, Bluetooth, ZigBee and infrared networks. The next in size is LAN, stands for local area network. The coverage of a LAN could be up to a few kilometers. Examples of LAN are Ethernet and Wi-Fi networks that you commonly see in buildings or campuses or, or houses. A LAN could span from few meters up to few kilometers. Ethernet, by the way, is a popular name for IEEE 802.3 standard and Wi-Fi is a popular name for IEEE 802.11 standard. The next is MAN. MAN stands for Metropolitan Area Network and it refers to networks that cover a whole city. They span up to a few tens of kilometers. Examples of MAN are cable TV network. They also provide internet access and WiMAX networks. It's a wireless network supposed to provide internet access uh, covering entire city. Finally, there is WAN, stands for Wide Area Network. And these networks uh, cover larger geographical area, it could be from a region uh, up to country or continent or even up to planetary scale. An example is the internet that we know. And also uh, telephone networks is another example. Satellite networks is, is another example. On a lighter note, in a computer networks course, one gets an overwhelming dose of what we call TLAs, which stands for three letter acronyms and you already have seen four in this slide. Now some more terminology. Switch is a device that connects multiple links and forwards traffic received on one link to other links. Could be you know forwarding to another just one link or could be several other links these slots here um, this rectangular things to which these wires are attached are called ports and this is a symbol of a switch As you can see, we can connect switches to build larger networks. All we need to do is to connect two ports 
on two switches by a link. The cloud symbol that you see here, um, it's, a, it's a shape drawn like a cloud. It refers to nodes and links that implement the network. It's a cloud that provides network services that are used by the hosts shown here by uh, you know these computers outside the cloud. The cloud symbol is basically a placeholder. It is used to indicate a part of network where we are not interested in the internal details of that part. The interconnection of two or more networks is called internetwork or internet for short. Note that we use internet with a small i to refer to this generic internetwork and we use internet with capital I to refer to the global TCP IP network. Router is a device that interconnects different networks and it uses store and forward mechanism to forward packets. Routers are also called gateways. Here is uh, an illustration of three networks connected by a router. Routers are represented by this symbol. So these are three routers. They are inter interconnecting three networks and as you can see we are not interested so much in the details of how those networks are implemented so we have simply drawn a cloud. We refer to the part of network that excludes hosts as subnet. I have shown the subnet in this example by uh, this green boundary. The functionality of a subnet is to carry data traffic between or among hosts. There is another more recent use of the term subnet in the context of addressing, which we will get to know later on. After learning these terminologies, we will move on to discussion of layered network architecture. Abstraction is central to layering. So what is an abstraction? Abstractions are useful in the sense that they give well-defined interface while they hide implementation details. Write abstractions provide very general services and they would allow efficient implementation. Let's take example of a car to understand the concept better. You do not need to know how car works in order to drive it. That's the job of a mechanical engineers. Cars typically export this abstraction of a steering wheel, accelerator, brake, clutch and gear, you know, for manual transmission cars and just gear for automatic cars. This allows you, this abstraction is, is such a powerful abstraction that it allows you to drive a car without knowing how car works internally. Moreover, it allows a car manufacturer to put anything under the hood and still it does not affect the way you drive. The manufacturer can decide to, to, to change the desi design of engine, you know, change the power of engine. Uh, maybe change from petrol engine to diesel engine. And maybe even electrical uh, electric cars these days. I mean, they don't have uh, engine in true sense. What they have is is batteries and motors. But uh, still, we have the same, you know, four or five things: steering wheel, accelerator, brake, um, and possibly um, clutch and gear to drive a car. So what an abstraction really means is that you abstract away the details. Networks are required to satisfy a demanding set of requirements. We want networks to provide general 
reliable packet delivery service we want networks to be robust we want networks to be fair and cost effective we want mobility from networks we want our network to to a scale to billions of hosts and therefore the uh, network software tends to be uh, quite complex layering is a technique that is used in software engineering to organize complex software in layering we, we basically arrange the software in layers uh, a sequence of layers where each higher layer uses the services that are provided by its lower layer while lower layer provides services to its upper layer it does not expose to the upper layer its implementation details and thus it enforces modularity here is a simple example of layering here we have added two levels of abstraction between hardware and application the first layer of abstraction is host to host connectivity and the second one is process to process channels this lower layer provides host to host connectivity while abstracting away the details of underlying network and process to process channel builds upon this host to host connectivity layer and provides process channel abstraction this layer might provide reliable message delivery service even in the face of occasional packet losses at host to host connectivity layer a decomposition like this allows us to break the network software development into manageable smaller parts as we discussed in the previous slide lower layer is service provider and upper layer is the user of that service for example hardware provides services to host to host connectivity so this is a provider of that service and host to host connectivity is the user of that service similarly uh, host to host connectivity provides service that process to process channel uses and so on similarly for process to process channel to application programs the entities that make up the same layer on two machines are called peers so if we had to implement this then we would have an instance of this layered architecture running on two different machines the entities that make up the same layer on two machines are called peers so this application layer on let's say this is host a and this is host b so these are peers similarly this process to process channel layer on these two machines are peers and another one is host to host and hardware protocol is simply a set of rules that defines how communication will take place they are very important um, in the sense that they are the basic building blocks of a network architecture a protocol defines two interfaces service interface and peer to peer interface the service interface is used within the same machine and peer to peer interface is used between peers on different machines service interface defines the interface and operations that a layer n protocol provides to a layer n 
plus one entity and peer-to-peer -peer interface defines the messages that are exchanged with peer. The term protocol is a bit overloaded. It means both a specification as well as implementation of interface. Here is an analogy that should help you in understanding layering and protocols. In this example, we have two philosophers and they speak different languages. This philosopher knows English, this philosopher knows French, but uh, this philosopher does not know French and he does not know English. And therefore, they hire a translator. So there is translator on both sides. And these translators translate the messages of this philosopher and pass on to a secretary. And the secretary um, sends it to the secretary on the other side via fax. Right? So that's the example. Now in this example, this translator defines uh, a layer, right? So this is layer two in this example. And in this case, they choose Dutch. So they both speak Dutch, right? So this lady translates whatever message comes from this philosopher at location A to, into Dutch. And then through fax, it goes to the other side and um, uh, it's received by the other translator who knows how to translate Dutch to French. Now suppose this philosopher wants to to convey this message that I like rabbits to the philosopher at location B. Then the translator at location A translates that phrase I like rabbits into Dutch and then she indicates in the header that the language of this message is Dutch. Now this is passed on to the secretary who further attaches her header on top of this, indicating her fax number, so that if there is a message from this secretary to be sent to her, she would know which fax message to send that message to. And things below this fax number are pretty much whatever was sent by the translator. Now on the other side, the reverse process happens. So she receives this message, fax number, language Dutch, and this translation as such. Now uh, what she does is she would remove this part, fax number, because there is no use for this two translators. So she passes the rest of this message, which is this header language is Dutch and this translation to the translator. The translator sees that this message is in Dutch uh, and then he knows that he has to translate into French because that's the agreement between the philosopher and him. And so he translates uh, this message into French and you know that's how uh, this philosopher gets that message. Now a few things I would like to stress here. So the benefit of layering is that one benefit at least uh, to begin with is that we can replace these translators with translators of different language for example German. So we could easily have a translator here that translates whatever comes from philosopher to German and then on the other side there's a, a translator that knows both German and French and you know he would be able to translate it appropriately. So that's one benefit. The second is that again on this layer uh, she can choose to use email instead of fax and that would not affect layer 2 and layer 3 at all. So what matters is that this message is sent to the translator as such. So as long as that happens, it does not matter how the secretary manages to do that. So instead of fax, 
she may choose to use email and the communication still goes through while we are at this example let me explain one more concept using this analogy so let's call um, these philosophers something so let's call him x let's call him y and let's say that uh, there's another philosopher z joins this location so he does not have a place to go so he, he you know and his friend with y so basically both of them you know share the same facility now again it's the same thing um, x is sending something i like rabbits uh, but then see now for this translator there is ambiguity right so he is now serving both him and uh, y and z both so he has to be told whom to deliver this message to right and that's uh, called demultiplexing right and that information is included in the header so the way it's going to work is that she is going to change the header a bit so x would indicate whom to send this message i like rabbits to so let's say that in this new example he wants to send it to z his new uh, philosopher that we have added so in addition to this language uh, she has to say that the recipient of this message is z right and this entire thing would now be part of header and again it comes down nothing else changes here other than whatever she gives is is sent by the secretary so recipient is z right so so that's the addition of this header again she gets this with this new header and she does not really have to know that there is a new philosopher it's it's completely irrelevant for her all she has to do is to take this fax number header in case she has to send a reply and then send it to this translator so now translator gets language is dutch and recipient is z now notice that he gets what this translator sent and then he basically um, looks at this it's dutch the recipient is z so let's say z speaks also french i mean just keep this simple so he would simply translate uh, this to french the same message but then instead of sending to y he would now send it to z right and this information uh, is it's uh, that allows uh, a lower layer protocol to send message to correct upper layer protocol is called demux key let us consider this simple layering example that we saw before suppose that host to host connectivity layer um, its functionality is provided by a protocol that we are going to call hhp stands for host to host protocol and the functionality of process to process channel are provided by uh, these two protocols request reply protocol and message stream protocol and let, let's say that we have um, just three applications in our example file application and a digital library application and video application and so this application program layer has these three applications process to process channel is implemented by these two protocols and host to host communication the connectivity has this one protocol hhp and uh, you know the bits basically go on hardware which is shown by these wires and cloud in this diagram these edges 
represent uh, depends on relation so all these edges and the protocols collectively make what we call protocol graph and the set of layers protocols and the protocol graph together define what we call network architecture an application would take a sequence of protocols to get its work done so in this case um, this file application is using these protocols rrp and hhp and therefore we can think of this arrangement as a stack and we call this protocol a stack so in this example uh, this r rp followed by hhp forms a protocol stack the importance of network architecture is that network architectures guide the design and development of networks in a layered architecture peers send messages to each other using what we call message encapsulation we have seen uh, in the philosophers analogy one example of message encapsulation there we saw that messages that were received from higher layers were encapsulated inside lower layer messages so let us uh, go through this example in the network architecture that we just saw we had uh, an application program using the services of request reply protocol uh, which was using the services of host to host protocol which was sending our data through network to the other side so in this example the, the application program sends uh, whatever data it wants to communicate to its peer to rrp right? and what rrp does is that it appends its header actually it prepends its header to data uh, and it might also add a trailer at the end and this rrp followed by data followed by trailer is passed on to the host to host connectivity protocol the host to host protocol would add its own header so now the message looks like the hhp header followed by rrp header followed by data and if rrp had added its trailer then it would be uh, this rrp trailer and followed by if hhp add adds decides to add um, its optional trailer then it would uh, be uh, appended at the end and what goes on the wire is this sequence of bits structured in this manner on the other side hhp receives these and hhp can only understand um, the header that its peer uh, put in front of this packet and the trailer that was put at the end and what hhp would do is it would remove these two pieces its header and its trailer and pass on to rrp uh, the rest of the message which means that it would have rrp header in front and uh, followed by a payload a lower layer would never forward its own header to an upper layer furthermore headers as i explained with this example uh, use dmux key when there is um, there are multiple choices to which uh, they can pass on the data they have received so in this case hhp 
in this example we just have application program but HHP remember I had an option to also um, to um, to send to protocol that we called MSP messages stream protocol in this case the data is for RRP and that piece is indicated in this header that uh, HHP on this side uh, attaches because it knows uh, which protocol gave the data to HHP to forward and so for um, for this you no know, protocol data unit it will simply indicates uh, this demultiplexing key um, in its own header and that's how HHP knows that this packet the remainder is supposed to be sent to RRP so it forwards to RRP and again um, RRP was serving you know several applications so RRP would have its own DMUX key inside this header and based on that it would ident identify a particular process uh, whom to uh, to give this data to as a general case suppose we have these three layers layer n layer n minus one and layer n minus two and layer n sends some message let's call m to its peer so uh, this is the message that was sent by layer n and received uh, by layer n minus one what layer n minus one would do is it would uh, add its header and suppose in this example that layer n minus one also adds a trailer so uh, this header h n minus one and this trailer t n minus one is added to uh, this message that was received from layer n and this is then passed on to layer n minus 2 and layer n minus 2 would add its header to this message that was received from layer n minus 1 before sending it to the layer below it and so this is the sequence of encapsulation at the sender side on the receiver side just the reverse of this happens so layer n minus 2 as we have discussed before would receive um, this message and what it will do is it will remove this header and then send it to uh, what is uh, remaining to layer n minus 1 which is exactly what was sent by the sender and then again same thing happens uh, again at layer n minus 1 on the receiver side it will strip off uh, these two pieces and uh, then the message that was sent uh, by layer n on the sender side is received by layer n on the receiver side this is a sketch of OSI reference model OSI stands for open systems interconnection it was put together by international standards organization also called ISO during year 83 to 95 the OSI model is called a reference model because uh, it was never implemented and it did not specify the services and protocol corresponding to its layers there are seven layers in OSI model they are called physical layer data link layer network layer transport layer session layer presentation layer and the topmost application layer these dashed lines indicate indirect peer protocol communications the names of data units that are exchanged at a particular layer varies from layer to layer 
at the bottom most layer physical layer bits are exchanged the data units exchanged at data link layer uh, are called frames at network layer they are called packets and at transport layer they are called messages or TPDU. PDU stands for protocol data unit so TPDU uh, stands for transport protocol data unit and then at session layer what gets exchanged is SPDU and at presentation layer it's PPDU and at application it's APDU in this model the end hosts host A and host B in this figure uh, they implement all the layers all these seven layers but the intermediate nodes like routers switches or hubs they may choose the bottom three layers or two layers or just one layer the bottom layers communicate in chain manner going from hop to hop so host a to to this router then from this router to some other router from that router to host b and uh, in this case this uh, we have router so they would implement uh, these three three bottom layers and so so the communication from this network layer at host a goes to the network layer of uh, the first router then the network layer of the second router and then the network layer of the host b so this communication happens in chain manner and transport layer is the first layer where the communication happens end to end and the transport layer the message exchange happens only between peers at end hosts now we shall go over the main functionalities of the seven layers of osi reference model the first one is physical layer physical layer handles the transmission of raw bits over a communication link this layer is concerned with reproducing the sent bits to the other end of a link this is the only layer with direct layer to layer communication the next is data link layer data link layer collects a stream of bits into a larger data unit which we call the frame although eventually bit streams are sent at the physical layer but we need to mark the beginning and end of frames and data link layer uh, does that the functionalities of data link layer are implemented inside network adapter along with device driver in operating system next is network layer network layer is mainly concerned with routing packets through subnet and providing quality of service is also a functionality of this layer the next is transport layer this layer is responsible for breaking up large data into smaller messages and then reassembly of this data at the receiver side as it says this layer implements a process to process channel the fifth layer is session layer session layer allows establishing sessions it provides a namespace that is used to tie together different transport streams that are part of one application the next is presentation layer presentation layer is concerned with format of data that is exchanged between peers it enables data exchange between big and little indian machines transparently the last one is application layer application layer protocols standardize common type of exchanges such as the message exchanges that happens in http or smtp or ftp contrary to the osi reference model the tcp ip reference model was developed to fit the existing tcp ip implementation 
this reference model has four layers a bottom most layer a second one the third layer and the fourth layer in this model the data link and physical layers are merged into one is net 1 through net n indicate different kinds of networks they could be wi-fi networks they could be ethernet uh, they could be cellular or uh, they could be satellite and so on and this ip layer provides connectionless best effort datagram service these two are transport layer protocols called tcp and UDP. TCP is used for reliable data delivery and UDP is used for real-time applications where delay is important. UDP is appropriate for applications that can tolerate some data loss but cannot tolerate long delays. Now coming to this hourglass the architects of the internet had the goals the main two goals that the internet must be able to interconnect a variety of networks and that it must support a variety of services that goal reflected in this hourglass shape of the internet architecture with the ip layer forming the narrowest of this hourglass. As I said, the IP layer provides the best effort datagram service. Accordingly, it requires minimal services from layers below. And this allows a variety of networks to be accommodated into the internet. On the other side, there can be arbitrarily many protocols above IP, each offering a different service to applications. Thus, the IP layer decouples the problem of providing host-to-host -host connectivity from providing process-to-process -process service. This narrow waist had been crucial for the rapid growth of the internet. This shows the commonly used model of internet architecture with five layers and in this course we are going to uh, progress from physical layer to data link layer to network layer to transport layer and we will discuss applications as we go on. The standard protocols used in the internet architecture are defined by uh, what is called IETF stands for Internet Engineering Task Force and IETF requires for a new protocol to be included in the architecture to have at least one representative implementation. How to map different functionalities that we require from network to different layers. And this was at least one guideline uh, to do this was put forward by Salser, Reed and Clark in 1984 in what they called end-to-end -end argument. End-to-end -end argument provides a guideline or a set of guidelines to select the right layer to assign a function. Ideally, a function could be assigned to a certain layer if that function can be provided completely at the layer in question. One example is encryption. If data is to be transmitted securely, then the encryption must be performed at the application layer and should not be left to the communication subsystem because the data will be in clear from at least from the endpoint to the receiving side application. This argument, however, 
allows implementation of functions partially at lower layers if doing so improves the performance. One example is file transfer application. Even though a file transfer application must perform integrity check at the receiver, retransmitting entire file due to errors on few links you know, causes significant performance loss and therefore integrity check at link level would eliminate the need for retransmission of a potentially large data file and thus saving from this performance loss. Thus the end-to-end -end argument is against replication of functionalities at lower layers but on the other hand allows if performance can be improved. This design keeps the complexities at the endpoints in the hosts while keeping the subnet simple. And this design contrasts with the telephone network that we saw earlier, where the endpoints, the you know plain old telephones were simple and the complexity was in the network. To summarize, layering refers to sequential modularity. The upper layer uses the services provided by the lower layer. Network software is organized in a layered architecture. The OSI reference model proposed a seven layer architecture and this model remained a reference model because uh, there was no implementation of this model. The commonly used internet architecture that we will see in this course has five layers and they are physical data link network transport and application layers. The narrow waste of the internet architecture which is the IP layer or the network layer had been crucial for the rapid growth of the internet. Here are the two classic papers uh, for further reading. The first one tells the overall philosophy of the uh, you know, design of uh, internet. And the second one discusses the end-to-end -end arguments. The Peterson and Devi textbook, the relevant sections are sections 1.2 and 1.3. And in Tenenbaum's book, it's chapter 1, sections 2 through 5. Here is a quiz for you. You might want to pause the video and find correct choices yourself before I show them to you in the next slide. The correct choices are A, C, E, and F. Layering is indeed a form of modularity. The second is wrong. It says a layer n protocol exchanges messages with layer n plus one protocol. Protocols exchange messages only with peer layers. So a layer n protocol would exchange messages with layer n protocol. This is correct. A layer N protocol provides services to its upper layer, which would be layer N plus one. This is wrong. OSI reference model had seven layers, not four layers. It was the TCP IP reference model that had four layers. This is correct. Transport layer is the first end to end layer. And lastly, except for physical layer communication at all other layers are indirect or virtual as we have seen before. See you next time.